Hi, Professor Pearson Brown. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Roberto. How are you today? Very good. From Caracas, nice weather, even though it's raining a little bit. How are you doing there? I'm doing well in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in the United States. It's kind of cold and rainy, but we're doing okay. Perfect, perfect. Well, this is our second conversation. Previously, mm -hmm. we had the chance of talking about one paper you prepared about systemic thinking and many people that, well, lawyers and practitioners in the law sectors will think, what's that about systematic and systemic uh, system thinking? So that's why I just loved your, your paper and I get in contact with you and I would like you to tell us a little bit what is all about this. Yeah, so I'm happy to talk to you about my paper, Systems Thinking Like a Lawyer. Um, I wrote this article because, there, like as you said, there's not a lot in uh, current legal academy about systems thinking, how to use it as a law professor, what is it for. Um, and so I first started thinking about systems thinking in the context of legal education for two reasons. First, because of my own experiences as a legal services at attorney in the United States, where I was told this story about a starfish. And I know that this sounds weird. Just go with me, right? So the idea is that there's this kid walking along the beach and there's all these starfish walking up on the shore. And so the child starts throwing the starfish back in the ocean. And someone comes up to the child and says, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. You'll never make any difference. There's so many starfish. And the kid throws a starfish into the ocean and says, well, I made a difference to that one. And so the moral of the story is supposedly that it doesn't matter if you're representing low-income clients over and over over again for the same issue, you might not be making any difference to the larger issue, but you're making a difference to that one family. And I think there's some benefit to being optimistic about that point. But in my practice, I found that really frustrating and not the best use of my time and resources to just be focusing on individuals when the problems that the clients that I was trying to serve were facing were systemic, were larger. So I was really interested in theories and approaches that amplified the importance of looking at root causes, of looking at the big, bigger picture. And then the second thing that inspired me to write the paper was uh, the encouragement of a mentor of mine who said, you know, we expect lawyers to be systems change agents, but we don't teach them anything about systems thinking. And so I thought that this was really an important comment, right? It was so simple, but it was so true that because lawyers are often called upon to use our expertise to engage in systemic problem solving, some portion of legal education ought to involve exposure to information about systems dynamics. So I'll tell you a little bit about what I've learned, what I cover in my paper. So systems thinking is a way of thinking and it's a set of practices. And it encompasses four key tenets. So the first is this idea that every outcome is a product of some system structure. We can think of systems as being parts connected for some purpose, and that every outcome that we observe in our daily lives, not just mechanical systems, but legal systems and interpersonal systems are the product of that structure, the arrangement of parts, how they're connected, what is the feedback between them, and so forth. The second idea is that systemic structures are embedded within and connected to one another. So it's not just a system between myself and my client where I maybe have knowledge, but my client has insight into the particulars of their situation. But there's also the fact that my practice, my relationship with my client is embedded in the system of law in which I practice, the jurisdiction that I'm a part of, but also certain social and normative constraints, right? That there's systems within systems, kind of like those stacking Russian dolls, right? Mm -hmm. So they're all connected. 
the third part is that um, these uh, structures can actually be discerned, that it's not just a theoretical concept that things are connected, but that we can actually think about the connections as either being linear or hierarchical or cyclical, right? That there is a structure that we can figure out and, and learn from uh, in relationship to the outcomes that are produced. And then finally, that systemic structures are resilient, but not fixed. And that means means that while the structural relationship between myself and the courts or myself and my client probably won't change in result of a lot of different kinds of interventions, it's not fixed. It's not that it can't change. It's just that systemic problems tend to be really resilient and resist a lot of different interventions. So, you know, in my paper, I go through these tenants I talk about how they can illuminate legal practice. I give some examples of teaching strategies that um, law professors can use to incorporate some of these concepts or introduce some of these concepts to students. And then I kind of do some reflecting on the benefit of system thinking to, to lawyers, given our dual role as participants in systems, but also this high call to be system architects. It is great. It is great. Well, see, I've been doing a lot of years practicing law here in Venezuela. And also I'm a professor in constitutional law and fundamental rights. And it is a fact that the world is every day is smaller and smaller. One, mm -hmm. one, one fact of that is this. You are in Pittsburgh. I'm in Caracas. We're talking. And the reality is that we have more normative systems than either the states. So I can more or less talk about constitutional law and you can have some idea of our constitution, even though you haven't read our constitution. So if we don't think systematically, it is going to be more difficult to us and for the students to understand how these different systems, they, they, they work each other. So... I can understand a little bit of contract law or constitutional law or nationality of or tax law. So I guess these these ideas that you put on your in your paper are great for teaching the new lawyers or new lawyering. Let's call it that way. The mm -hmm. the lawyer of the future. How yeah. do you think or what do you think will, they will be the skills for the new? Well, not the new, the future lawyers concerning this uh, systematic uh, systemic thinking. Yeah. So I think that there are a couple of skills that we're going to be impressing upon the lawyers of the future, right? And so the first is one I talk about, which is surfacing systems. So not just talking about, oh, the, the system here or the systems there, but actually bringing to mind what are those connections? How are they in dialogue with one another? And being able to talk about them specifically in terms of their component parts, but also in terms of the feedback is the communication between um, a particular case that I'm dealing with or a particular holding in a court case, uh, is it going to reinforce conduct that we want to see in our society? Is it going to restrict conduct that we want to see in society? Or is it going to keep uh, human behavior within a certain range, right? Some people might, you know, not follow the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law is preserved, right? And that's a theme, as you said, that moves from, it doesn't matter what jurisdiction you're practicing in, those themes of how law is in conversation with human behavior show up in every nation, every, uh, you know, organization that that is governed by law or procedure, right? So students are going to be able to talk about law in terms of those really specific feedback processes. They're also going to be able to talk about the effect of legal law enforcement and legal outcomes in terms of things like delay, right? So what does it mean to have delayed feedback? Well, just because I uh, had one case that got this really positive outcome, say I'm doing special education advocacy and I secure a really great outcome for one client with disabilities, the impact of that might be delayed because I'm doing it one case at a time, as opposed to if I'm able to pass a law that says you can no longer uh, withhold certain services from children with disabilities, right? The, the feedback on that is gonna come much faster than if I'm attacking the same issue case by case. 
So they're going to have that language and that mindset around how systems operate and be able to translate that into the different areas of law that they're studying. But I think a second really important characteristic is that the law student of the future won't see their legal practice as being uh, just a, a, a monolith or monodisciplinary, right? They'll be more open to seeing the practice of law as something that you engage in alongside economists, alongside uh, physicians, alongside public health officials. Because when we're looking systemically at problems, we realize that just because something surfaces in a legal matter that's actionable, right? I can sue you for not paying rent, or I can evict you for not paying rent. We understand that the context of a low income uh, renter is tied to our economic system of whether or not we offer people a living wage or our healthcare system of whether or not we're going to provide universal insurance. So if I'm really going to try to target the problem that perpetuates homelessness, for example, I have to do my legal advocacy in tandem with professionals from other fields because the problem is systemic and encompasses the challenges that those other professionals are, are addressing. I really like that you mentioned the multidisciplinary approach of this, because recently I've been working a lot with friends, uh, well, working and have these friends from computer science and economics. So and we'll see that every day the computer science is everywhere. I mean, the, the evidence, the well, we just saw a really interesting uh, trial in the United States that the deposition of uh, witnesses was using the telephones and so on. And we see some systems like mine, for example, in, in Venezuela, they're really stuck on that. And then you realize that among all the, the specialties and all the professions, the legal professional legal practice is the one hard, it, it is hard to, to move forward into mm -hmm. this world of technologies. Have you facing that with all professors and new, uh, new students? How can we, merge that idea of law it has to be a certain in certain way really structured but at the same time have to tend to new te technologies yeah that's such a great question and i'm thinking about it in response to the pandemic because when everything shut down because of covid we had to figure out how to do court remotely And so we were doing court hearings through Microsoft Teams and through Zoom and through these other software and technologies. And so on the one hand, you know, we just sort of had to adapt because there was a crisis. But what we learned from that, particularly because I serve so many clients that have disabilities, it actually was better for them to be able to participate in court through the computer because the, the judge could then see into their homes and see what was going on behind them. They could see the care that the parents had to provide or they could see the limitations of the person. And before everybody had to go to court and that was a barrier to, to justice for people with disabilities because there wasn't good transportation to court because court is on the 17th floor, they couldn't get there, right? So it really opened things up in this way that we weren't expecting or that we didn't realize that we could have. And now that people are vaccinated, people aren't wearing their masks anymore, there's this expectation that we should just go back into court. And I'm like, no, we shouldn't go back. Like, this was actually better. And so when you talk about how law can be slow to change and slow to absorb new technologies, that's a really important example of that. We use the technology because there was a crisis, but we can continue to use that technology if it's going to enhance access to justice. And that's You know, a, another important insight that goes back to systems thinking is see how all of these parts fit together. This didn't just have to be a tool of crisis. This could be a tool of increasing access and giving people more opportunity to address their, their grievances. And so I think that technology certainly plays a part in that because it touches on these relationships between all of these different systems. Yes, and all this for sure affects the access to justice. So Absolutely. everyone can be in, in, in any situation and with access to internet, you can, you know, put a claim and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, see, I'm right now working in a, well, it's, it's a thinking, it's a, it's, a, it's a project that I'm having, personal project that is called pre Creative Legal Thinking. So it is mm -hmm. promoting other subjects different than, you know, civil law, tort law, criminal law. 
having some other multidisciplinary approach, if you had the chance of promoting any subjects or any themes to work on that, what would you think it will be interesting for the new lawyers, for the future lawyering to study? Yeah, that's such a great question. So there's two big ones. Um, one is design thinking, which I think is already starting to have inroads, but there's another design related approach called transition design, which I think has a lot of untapped potential for uh, law school learners. So design thinking is an iterative process where we think about how we can problem solve by approaching it the same way that a design team might approach the development development of a new product or a new tool, right? You sort of empathize with your user, you define the problem, you uh, sort of brainstorm uh, different ideas, you sort of prototype, you practice with your prototypes, you go through an iterative process, and then you get feedback and you cycle and, and rotate through that as many times as you need to until you've addressed the problem in a way uh, that meets your user's need. But that mindset, that uh, that approach can really apply to policy. And especially as we're trying to think more about community empowered approaches to public policy, I think it's really important for law students to learn how to engage in a process like design thinking with a cluster of clients or a community of clients rather than just a single person that you signed a retainer agreement with to go through that step-by-step -step process to really understand what the client needs, not just what the law sort of prescribes or or permits, right? And related to that is uh, an approach called transition design, which is developed by uh, one of my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon University, Terry Irwin, which is a six-part process that invites communities to center a large systemic problem, think about it in terms of the stakeholders to that problem, come up with definitions to the problem that are situated in sort of a past, present, and future context. And then as we begin to brainstorm with these stakeholders what the ideal solution might look like, we sort of walk that back or back cast into the things that we have available in the present and then ultimately create an ecology of interventions to solve a systemic issue. And again, I think that learning is so important for law students because it breaks us out of the silo of law. It gets you into a place where you're problem solving in tandem with community. And it also exposes law students to um, the, the perspective that community members might have on the way things really are or what resources already exist. Again, so that we're not just sort of thinking about, well, either this is legal or this is illegal, or you have a claim or you don't have a claim, you have standing, you don't have standing. This helps us to see that the solutions to a problem can come from community members, can come from the elements of solutions that we already have in the present, and that they must be executed in tandem with interventions at other pain points or other opportunity points in the broader system. So it gets them thinking holistically, it gets them working collaboratively, and it sort of decenters the lawyer as the problem solver, but rather repositions us, I think rightly so, as one of several problem solvers. Like we have certain tools that are great, but they aren't the only tools. And I think that lawyers can handle sort of not being the center of the universe a little bit, especially when it comes to solving these larger systemic problems. Well, I don't want to get in problem with, with trouble with, with uh, <laughs> lawyers, but yes, we do are a little bit, you know, we believe that we're the center of the universe sometimes. Yeah. And uh, well, and I had to write, I have to see and, and read that paper on transitional uh, thinking. It will be great. Let me work on that. And mm. finally, are you sure, I'm sure, that legal culture is, th is changing during this uh, few years? The legal culture, will we see it more universal, but at the same time more distributed? Mm. 
You know, I agree with you, Roberto, that the world is getting smaller. And so I am hopeful that we'll see more embrace of these sort of non-traditional but really universal approaches to understanding systemic problems. Like the dynamics of power don't care if you're in the United States or Venezuela or in China or some other location, right? Like power operates in the same way. And I think that the barriers to achieving justice, depending on however poverty looks like wherever you're practicing law are, are going to be really similar. So I hope that as, as as globalization increases and as students become more attuned to the need to solve problems outside of just their specific locality where they're studying or where they're learning, I think we'll see more embrace of, of these themes. So I, I remain optimistic and I think that there's real value in continuing to teach law students to think outside the box by thinking more expansively about the nature of social problems. I personally have this belief that we think kind of superstition on legislation and there are other ways to, to create law. We'll see phenomenons like uh, the, the, the social media and we see computer programs that are creating law. So we have to see the idea of law beyond legislation. That's more or less what I, what I feel. And there are certain creators of law beyond the idea of the states beyond the mm. idea of legislators. So probably this systemic thinking and probably this multidisciplinary thinking will help us to understand more, more open, more wide, more universal law understood has beyond legislation. And I, yeah. that's what I loved about reading your, your paper. I open up the, the, the thinking, taking my blinds off. Yeah, yeah. One of my students actually said that she felt like it was like taking the blinders off because you're taught to approach a, a legal problem from start to finish in a particular way. But when you sort of see how the client moves through a legal process, I think the example in my paper is uh, a Social Security case, you really see that there's a lot more going on than just what the law allows or what the rules say you need to do first, second, and third. And I think to your point about where new sources of law are coming from, I think you're exactly right. You know, culture creates rules. And so some of those rules get to be laws, right? They're sort of codified and recognized by a, a government that holds power. But humans regulate each other in all kinds of ways all the time. So there's all these other checks and, and maybe some balances on, on what's permissible that have nothing to do with the law. And I think as lawyers, we can't pretend like those don't exist. And if you don't know what those are for your client or for the environment in which you're practicing, you're going to be at a real disadvantage to bring about the outcomes that your client might want. I have a, a, a small uh, essay that I wrote uh, in uh, the journal Quaderno about cu cancel culture as kind of like uh, an innovation in um, accessing power, right? So you can think about when people get canceled, that's sort of a way of of um, uh, imposing a rule on someone. You can't speak here anymore. You can't work here anymore. That has nothing to do with legal. Pro I mean, there was no due process, right? Like we just said, no, you've got to go because you've done something that was so against the norms of the people that you are working with. I mean, it's so fascinating. That's an example of a policy that's just coming from culture. It and so to your point, Yes, yeah, it we will be, it, it, will, that. it will be equal like the social death, your death in that society. So they, they are they are depriving you of participating. So it is interesting. It, it, this opens doors that we can start talking and more and more and more. And it's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, tomorrow, I'm really, really, really happy and enjoying this conversation. But I would like you to close with some comments and some recommendations for students lawyers and other agents like uh, judges and uh, scholars? 
Yeah. So um, my number one takeaway is I think that everyone should read this book. It's called Systems Thinking, Thinking in Systems, excuse me, by Donella Meadows. Um, it really turned me on to systems thinking. And that's how I've opened my own mind to thinking about the law and legal practice in different ways. So I want to leave everyone with that recommendation. But if you don't have a legal program where you're at that can teach you about systems thinking, or you're already starting to incorporate some of the these ideas, I encourage you to just partner with the other professionals around you who are addressing the same issues as you, but might be doing it in a different way. So for example, um, when I'm not writing, my legal practice is in a medical legal partnership between my law school, the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, and uh, UPMC Children's Hospital, which is our major children's hospital provider in Pittsburgh. And in that partnership, we have law students at the pediatric hospital doing legal needs screenings of families and providing brief advice and direct representation. And this is an example of systems thinking in action because we're bridging the legal system with the healthcare system and providing legal services in a new context to increase access to justice for other people. Because we recognize that if you're a person with disabilities, you don't just have legal problems, you might have other medical problems or other social problems, and we can address all of those in one place place. So if you are able to find non-legal practitioners that are addressing the same issues with you, there's going to be opportunities for synergy and partnership and let that be your guide. That is how you can start practicing systems thinking right away. Excellent. Excellent. And I'm preparing this uh, program and this seminar on creative legal thinking, counting on the, when, with the participation of non-exclusive uh, legal practitioners. We need a lot of practitioners from all other over dis disciplines. Absolutely. Tomar, I'm really, really, really happy. I enjoy having this conversation. I hope we have further and future conversation about this. And this is your house. Anytime that you want to have a theme to talk about, we'll do it. That would be wonderful, Roberto. Thank you so much. And I hope that your program on creative thinking and law goes really well. I hope to. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.